synergy this is likely to be. Uh, I believe that we are unbelievably fortunate to have Adam Schiff in the position he's in as chairman of the House Intelligence Committee. <laughs> such a critical time. I'm Mel Levine, by the way. Um, I served in Congress many years before Adam, um, uh, also under Republican presidents, along with my very dear friend Howard Berman. Uh, at the time, <laughs> at the time that I was there, and it's part of the time that Howard was there, uh, we served in the House uh, when Ronald Reagan was president, when George H.W. Bush was president, and Howard when George W. Bush was president. And even though as Democrats, uh, we profoundly disagreed with virtually every policy that these presidents uh, undertook, uh, I think I can speak for Howard when I say that it never crossed our mind uh, that these presidents were a danger to our own country and that the policies that they were pursuing uh, ran the risk of undermining our democracy uh, and certainly gave the appearance uh, too often uh, that they never gave the appearance uh, that they were in any way in thrall of any uh, foreign adversary. All of that has changed. Congressman Schiff is now chairman of the Intelligence Committee at a time very different from any, any time in our history, certainly the times that we served in Congress. So Adam, uh, I want to ask you a variety of questions that flow from that, but before getting to that, I want to ask you one very tough question. Uh, what do you think of Dick and Lois Gunther? <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> I think your mic slid down on you. Now. Oh, okay. Um, well, I'm glad we started with that question and that I have the opportunity to congratulate uh, Dick Lo and Lois uh, on this uh, wonderful award and recognition. Um, I was mentioning to the rabbi, I didn't know where she was going when she brought up that scene in When Harry Met Sally. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was going to get much more personal than I was expecting. Um, but it was the perfect reference. Uh, we have individual role models, and, and Howard Berman has been one of mine. Um, but we have the Gunthers as role models for what a married couple can be, uh, what a a life together can be and how a life together can be much more than a life apart. And I, I'm just so grateful to have gotten to know them, uh, so inspired by their devotion to each other, their devotion to uh, peace in the Middle East uh, and justice uh, here at home. Uh, and they're just a fabulous uh, example for all of us. So uh, I, I'm thrilled to be on the same platform with the Gunthers and with my good friend uh, Mel. Thank you. Ditto. Um, Adam, I think the audience here would be very interested in learning what you anticipate your committee will be doing uh, when Congress reconvenes. What can we expect to come from your committee as well as the Judiciary Committee and the Oversight Committee with regard to the range of outrages that we see from the White House? We are predominantly focused uh, on the Intel Committee on any issues that could compromise our national security. Uh, that is, any form of compromise that might be influencing U.S. policy in ways that are not in U.S. interests. So we're endeavoring not to uh, replicate what Bob Mueller did. Uh, we don't have anywhere near the resources uh, that Bob Mueller could bring to his investigation, but rather predominantly to look into issues that he did not address. Uh, and as a former prosecutor, we have it uh, drummed into, uh, into our psyche. You follow the money. Uh, and you know, particularly, I think, with this president and this first family, it is a more important maxim than ever. Uh, so we are looking at financial motivations that may be driving U.S. policy. Uh, so we began by a money laundering investigation that is focused uh, on Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank has had a, a history of laundering Russian money. Uh, they were fined by the state of, the, of New York hundreds of millions of dollars for laundering Russian money. It was also the one major financial institution willing to do business with the Trumps. Um, and 
if the Russians had been engaged in illegal or unethical business practices with the president or his business organization, that provides leverage uh, over the Russians. Uh, and we've already seen that there, there already existed other Russian leverage vis-a-vis -vis the president. Uh, in particular, the president was seeking to consummate uh, what would have been the most lucrative business deal of his life during the presidential campaign, the construction of a massive tower uh, in Moscow, Moscow Trump Tower, that would have not only been the tallest building in Russia, it would have been the tallest building in all of Europe. Uh, Mueller estimated that that project stood to make the Trumps hundreds of millions of dollars. And at the time they were pursuing that, the president was deceiving the country about it and saying he had no business dealings with Russia. Now, the Russians knew otherwise. Uh, and in fact, uh, as part of our investigation, we found that Michael Cohen, uh, as an agent of the Trump Organization, had been in direct contact with the Kremlin to get their help. Had had, among other things, a lengthy conversation on the phone with the Kremlin. Uh, and you have to presume that the Kremlin might be recording such a call. And so to have a president in the position of having denied business dealings and the Russians in possession of evidence that could prove the president a liar is a deeply compromising situation. Um, there may, may be more compromise, though, and uh, that's the reason why we continue to uh, look at the financial issues. Uh, and it's important uh, for me to point out we're not only looking at the potential that Russian money or Russian business or Russian financial entanglement may, may be driving U.S. policy, but that other financial entanglements uh, in the Gulf may be driving U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis the Gulf. Um, we have seen, uh, Mel, just within the last uh, few weeks, tragically, the president and his family uh, and his campaign um, operating on exactly the wrong message from the whole Russia debacle that we went through in the last election. Uh, and that is they are now going to a different foreign country to once again get foreign assistance in a U.S. presidential election, this time by the president sending his personal lawyer to Ukraine uh, to seek to get the Ukraine government to investigate one of his political opponents, that being uh, Mr. Biden. And the, uh, the danger here is, is not only interference in our election, which is profound, obvious, obviously, but the Ukrainians are in desperate need of U.S. military support to fend off the Russians who have invaded their country. Uh, the Congress has approved weapons for Ukraine, but the administration is holding up the provision of these weapons to Ukraine. So they're holding up military assistance to Ukraine to defend its democracy. At the same time, the president is sending his emissary to ask for help with their presidential campaign. Um, the conflict could not be more profound or troubling, and so we are uh, also investigating this issue. But these are the nature of uh, the issues we're focused on in the Intel Committee, the Government Reform Committee is focused on other financial uh, impropriety, um, such as the hush money payments, uh, the illegal receipt of corporate contributions during the presidential campaign, the multiple violations of the Emoluments Clause, uh, and the Judiciary Committee as the committee that will be, if we go down this road, uh, the venue for an impeachment, uh, is pursuing a, a broad range of issues, but most pointedly, the issues of obstruction of justice. Uh, we are, um, and, I, and I think that this is something not particularly well understood, we are really trying to get the evidence itself um, in all of these cases and issues. The Mueller report is merely a summary of the evidence. The evidence itself will be the witness testimony and documents, but the administration has been stonewalling our efforts to do so, so we're having to litigate this in court. And it's vitally important that we succeed in that litigation because a lot more is riding than just whether we're able to conduct an investigation of this president, but rather whether any future president will feel they're under any inhibition to be as malfeasant or corrupt as they wish uh, because the Congress is either capable or incapable of enforcing its oversight. Uh, so we're gonna have to litigate this and we're gonna have to win this, and if we don't, uh, it would unalterably affect the balance of power among our institutions in a way that I think would be deeply tragic for the country. Well, let me pick up on that on two levels. One is it's obviously going to take some time uh, for these issues to go through the courts. I don't know um, how many levels of appeal you're likely to see pursued, but you can assume, I, I would gather, 
they'll appeal as much as they can. Um, what is an effective remedy when you have them clearly trying to run out the clock in terms of making it somewhere between difficult and impossible to get the answers to the questions you're seeking in a timely fashion? And secondly, talking about the separation of powers, how does Congress reclaim its power of the purse in the context of a president who now can, uh, with the concurrence of the Attorney General, uh, divert funds from any program at once, particularly military readiness, including military readiness in Europe, um, in order to take those funds and use them to build as well? well let me start with the, the latter question. Um, we are in the midst right now of already writing our own set of post-Watergate reforms. Um, a lot of things that we thought were norms of office that were inviolate, we find out uh, can be violated apparently with impunity. Uh, and so uh, we are drafting, for example, legislation that would accelerate court process to enforce congressional subpoenas uh, so that a future administration cannot run out the clock. Uh, we are looking at legislation. I've introduced a bill to try to discourage abuse of the pardon power uh, by providing that if a president pardons anyone in an investigation in which he or a member of his family or her family is a witness, subject, or target, that the complete investigative files will be provided to the Congress. We are going to have to strengthen the mechanisms to ensure that future presidents cannot divert funds that are allocated one for one purpose to another. The reason why our mechanisms thus far have been ineffectual is because one party is completely unwilling to stand up to the president in any meaningful way. Um, and I, I think when this chapter of history is written, some of the most damning language will um, be applied to my GOP colleagues for their unwillingness to defend the institutions of our democracy when they were most under assault. Um, if the GOP members of the House and Senate, for example, will not defend our most important power, that is the power of the purse, um, if they won't defend their own institution, what hope is there that they'll defend any other institution? Uh, and the answer is little to none. Um, I used to uh, debate about which was the most important power of Congress. Was it the power of the purse or was it the power to declare war? And I've concluded that it's the power of the purse because the power of the purse gives you the ability to defund a war. It gives uh, effect to that declaration or the unwillingness to declare war. Um, and if they're not willing to defend that power, then they're not willing to de defend anything. Uh, the GOP in Congress has become little more than a cult of the president's personality, which uh, I think is a, a startling revelation that that could happen uh, in such short order that someone as deeply flawed as the President of the United States could remake an entire political party in their image overnight, but this is what's happened. In terms of what's happening right now and our enforcement efforts in the courts, um, the good news is that the courts understand that delay is the object. Uh, and so they have been uh, accelerating the timetable. Uh, we got to the district court, for example, in the Deutsche Bank litigation that I'm involved in and uh, Maxine Waters as chair of financial services is involved in. We got there in record time. Uh, the court consolidated over the opposition of the Trump people uh, the hearing on the preliminary injunction with the hearing on the merits. And the opinion that followed almost immediately after that hearing uh, was uh, uh, not only in our favor, but essentially the judicial equivalent of get the hell out of our courtroom, Trump administration, and don't let the door hit you in the backside on the way out. Um, the Court of Appeals schedule in that litigation, as well as the Mazur's accounting litigation, has also been accelerated. Those oral arguments have already taken place. So by the standard of the federal courts, we're moving with breakneck speed. By everyone else's measure, though, uh, it is um, laboriously slow. Uh, and the reality is they may be able to simply run out the clock using, uh, or more accurately, abusing the court process. If, for example, we get to the Supreme Court or even in the Court of Appeals, 
the court uh, and courts often wish to avoid having to resolve a constitutional question between two branches, decides rather than a firm adjudication that they're going to remand it back to the trial court with instructions. Um, that might mean that it goes back to the trial court and then has to be appealed again to the Court of Appeals and go back to the Supreme Court. So the long and the short of it is they may be able to, on some of these issues, play rope-a-dope um, successfully throughout this session. If that's the case, we will have to decide uh, whether to move forward on impeachment in the absence of these witnesses and testimony. Uh, on the grounds, among others, of the obstruction of Congress's lawful function, uh, which is in and of itself a grounds for impeachment. Uh, but I need to say with respect to impeachment, because I think there's a great deal of uh, misapprehension on the subject, impeachment does not resolve the problem. Impeachment will not remove him from office. He will be acquitted in the Senate. Uh, the only way to remove the president from office will be at the polling place. Uh, and we, we, and we, and when I say we, I'm not talking about Americans uh, for Peace Now, which is a nonpartisan <laughs> organization, but I am referring to my party and its supporters. Uh, we must not lose sight of the imperative of what takes place at the polling uh, place. Um, to me, the most powerful argument for impeachment has also been the most powerful argument against it. It's what continues to stay my hand. And that is the most powerful argument for it is it's the most powerful censure we have. Uh, and if any president's conduct deserves censure, it's this one. Um, but it's also true that should the president be acquitted uh, in the Senate, that will be an adjudication that these acts are not impeachable offenses. And I worry about that precedent in the future as well. Um, but time may force our hand uh, one way or another. Um, if we're doing this rationally, we ought to have the witnesses and the testimony and the documents before we make a decision whether to impeach a president. Uh, but uh, we've never faced this kind of wholesale obstruction before, so we may have to make a judgment in the absence of being able to have that firsthand evidence. What about a censure motion? that wouldn't go to the Senate? Well, one of the things that, if, if it is necessary for us to go down this road, I think we should consider, and um, one of my former professors, Larry Tribe, has written on this subject, whether it's necessary to send an impeachment to the Senate for trial. Uh, it may be possible, uh, if it is necessary, to impeach the President in the House, um, to impeach him, but not send it to the Senate for trial. But how do you stop the Senate from taking it up if you've if you voted to impeach in the House? Say McConnell decides he's going to take it up. Well, McConnell could decide to take up a symbolic vote on an impeachment. It wouldn't be the same, though, as having a trial in the Senate. Um, McConnell could do that, of course, now, even in the absence of House action. And should we take up a motion to censure, McConnell could presumably take up a motion to um, reject any form of censure mm -hmm. or applaud the president. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, we, we have discussed uh, the possibility of a censure of, of a non-impeachment variety. Uh, there hasn't been a huge appetite for it. Uh, so my guess is that we will either proceed to impeachment or we will make the decision uh, not to proceed to impeachment. But that is the decision I imagine we will have to make by the end of the year. There was an interesting, not entirely dissimilar soap opera occurring in Britain, where a substantial number of Boris Johnson's members of his political party, as of a few days ago, decided to not go with him. Um, in your view, is there any political pressure or other pressure that could be brought to bear among Republicans here? Um, that would in any way change the mix and lead to something similar in the United States uh, that, what, that occurred in Britain with regard to members of that party um, abandoning their leader? I don't think so. Um, it is possible that uh, when the economy changes, and it will change at some point, now whether it changes between now and 2020 or sometime thereafter, when the economy changes, um, the issue that has propped up this otherwise deeply unpopular president 
may cause the floor to cave in. Uh, and there, there is certainly the potential that the desire for self-preservation uh, allows the GOP to find its soul. Um, but I'm not holding out hope uh, for that. Um, I have much more hope and faith in the voters at the ballot box than that my Republican colleagues uh, find their voice. Uh, at one level, you can understand it. At another level, it's completely inexplicable. At one level, they're afraid. Uh, they don't want to be the subject of an angry tweet or constant tirades by Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson and their ilk on Fox. Uh, the president enjoys 85% popularity in the GOP, and as long as that th is the case, they don't want to risk a primary challenge. At that very kind of mundane level, you can understand it. But at another level, it's utterly inexplicable to me, which is, what's the point of being in Congress? Why are they even there? If they're not going to do what the country needs them to do, why are they even there? Uh, and it may be that the British parliamentarians have a greater devotion to their democracy than some of our members have to ours. Uh, but I, I, we've gone through successive issues and controversies, uh, and there have been so many disappointments when we thought that the GOP would finally, this would be the final, last straw, that I've pretty much given, hope, given up hope. And instead what has happened, and this is a dangerous thing for the country, is we're becoming inured to this kind of unethical and dangerous conduct. Uh, if you look back and you rewind the clock to the point when the president was saying there were good people on both sides of this neo-Nazi rally, um, there were members of the GOP in Congress who spoke out, there were members of even the administration who spoke out, there were even members of Trump's own family who spoke out. There were corporate CEOs who spoke out. Now the president tells for my colleagues to go back to where they came from. Um, and no one speaks out. Um, none of the CEOs that spoke out before have bothered to weigh in. None of the GOP members of Congress have said anything worth listening to. Um, we've become numb to this, and, uh, and that's a, a very dangerous trend. Um, so, you know, what, what gives me optimism at the end of the day, um, the reason I'm confident we're going to get through this, is the people that feel the way we do vastly outnumber those who feel the way the president does. We register and turn out those people at the polling places, we will win. We do our jobs, we will win. Uh, our future is in our hands. We control our destiny. They cannot say that because they don't have enough numbers. They can do everything right and still lose. They need us to fail. Um, and I would much rather be in control of my destiny. So I'm confident we'll get through this. Uh, I hope the repudiation is huge because the rest of the world right now are looking to America and wondering whether this is a bout of temporary insanity like Brexit, or whether we have simply lost our way, irretrievably lost our way. And I think the size of the repudiation will be really important to restoring the world's faith uh, in, in this country, as well as restoring our own confidence uh, in the American idea. Louis is signaling me, and I know you have a plane to catch, so I'm going to try to wrap my additional 50 questions into one summary and respond sort of... And I'm willing to push it a little with my flight. So well, I don't know how much... I don't know... Uh, uh, well, okay. Five <laughs> so, just respond to the following. There's so many things, and they jump at you almost every day, today. Um, peace talks at Camp David on Afghanistan. Do you want to respond to that? Iran, Iran-Israel, two-state solution. Um, <laughs> what, <laughs> take, sort of respond to each of those. I get, I get it. <laughs> At that rate, I'll be taking the red eye tonight. Uh, well, let me, let me start with Afghanistan. Um, 
there's only one uh, ultimate path to resolution of the conflict uh, in Afghanistan, and it's going to have to be a negotiated outcome. Um, we can fight there indefinitely. The Afghans can fight there indefinitely. Um, that's not going to bring about a peaceful end. So there's going to have to be a negotiated end. Uh, and I'm grateful that uh, we have people, uh, serious negotiators, that are laboriously in discussions uh, with the Taliban. I think that's very important. Um, this reality TV spectacle that the president was trying to put on at Camp David um, was very much like his high-stakes summit with North Korea, and that is ill-prepared, ill-planned, and therefore unsuccessful. Uh, and it would be difficult, is difficult, under the best of circumstances to negotiate a, a final end to the war in Afghanistan, and to do so in a way that can give us any confidence that the Taliban will be forced to honor their commitments, uh, won't simply overrun the country, um, uh, marginalize is too far a weak a word, but uh, wreak the havoc it did on the female half of its population, uh, or once again become a haven for al-Qaeda. Uh, there are going to have to be enforceable mechanisms uh, to make sure that the Taliban honor their commitments. Uh, and I think in the president's haste to have something to show and um, the negotiations haven't reached the point where we can have confidence that uh, this is anything but um, a dressing on a, an outcome that um, has profound risks associated with it. So Curley wasn't ready for this week. The Afghan government, our partner in Afghanistan, has been excluded from these negotiations. Uh, now, Ghani was apparently coming here, although there's some conflict about it, um, because I think it was better than being completely excluded. But uh, the Afghan government has deep reservations about our negotiating position, strategy, and where we are. Uh, but the long and the short of it is, it wasn't ready for prime time, and it fell apart. Uh, and who knows where that leads us to now. But ultimately, it's going to have to lead us back to a very difficult negotiation and hopefully a better outcome than we would have seen had this gone forward this week. Uh, in terms of the situation with Iran, I had a, uh, an illustrative conversation with a, one of our uh, ambassadors recently, and I will um, name names to protect the not-so-innocent. Um, but this is one of our... our uh, new appointed ambassadors uh, to one of our allies. Uh, and I was, as part of a congressional delegation, uh, visiting this ally. And we got into a discussion with the, the staff at the embassy about why this nation was unwilling to attribute these attacks on the Strait of Hormuz to Iran, uh, when the evidence was so clear of Iranian responsibility. And one of the diplomatic uh, officers, and maybe because the ambassador was present, uh, made the diplomatic case, well, you know, they, they just want more proof. They just want more evidence. They also like to act in concert with their neighbors. And I said, honestly, I don't think that's what's going on here. Um, the, the intelligence is so clear and unequivocal. Um, I think what's going on here is our allies warned us that this would be exactly the consequence of leaving the JCPOA. And this consequence having come to fruition, that is Iran escalating the, the, the tensions, uh, trying to drive a wedge between us and our allies, um, this having come to fruition, our ally is now deeply reluctant to lock arms with us in what it appears may be a march towards war. I think that's what's staying in their hand. I don't think it's any question about the intelligence. I mean, we have, you know, and you've seen the video of the Iranians going to collect their limpet mine off the side of the ship. Um, I would hate to have been that uh, Iranian military uh, officer who had to explain uh, to the IRGC um, why their explosive didn't go off and we've got to go retrieve it. Um, but uh, the, the, the danger that we're in now is 
having withdrawn from the JCPOA, uh, having precipitated exactly what we expected, that is not just the uh, violence in the Strait of Hormuz, but also Iran now starting to slowly exceed uh, the limits on its enrichment and research on new centrifuges, having seen these things now come to pass, um, the administration's never had a plan for where we go from here because its strategy has been one more of theology than of, of thought out diplomacy. And uh, if they were smart, uh, they would listen and, and tune in to the voices in Iran now, some coming from some very unlikely places, including people like Ahmadinejad, who are saying maybe we should go back to negotiate. Um, they would seize that opportunity. But of course, for that to lead anywhere successful would mean that they would have to have the kind of diplomatic skill and patience and perseverance that they have shown no capacity for. Uh, and so none of us know where this is going to lead. And uh, uh, in Congress, we are doing our best, obviously, to uh, constrain uh, the risks, to mitigate the risks. I, I don't think the president wants to go to war with Iran. Um, I don't think Iran wants to go to war with us. The big risk, of course, is that we blunder our way into a war. Uh, I was mentioning to Mel, I was part of a small delegation of House members invited to the White House to meet with the President on the day he would later call off this strike on Iran. And on the way there, we were wondering, what was this about? Was this a photo opportunity? Uh, was this in order to say they consulted with Congress and then they would go and do whatever they had planned to do. I came away, and I'm not someone inclined to give the president the benefit of any doubt, but I came away with the impression he actually wanted to hear from people other than Pompeo and Bolton, that he was not comfortable with what they were advising, uh, because it was clear in the meeting that Pompeo and Bolton really didn't want us there. Um, it's actually quite funny, Mel, when we first arrived and I sat down at the table and the president came in, he looked across the table, first person he saw was me, um, and he visibly blanched. Um, he did one of these. Um, I think he'd been told that the chair of the Intel Committee was coming, but didn't put two and two together. Uh, he, saw, he thought it was Nunes. <laughs> it could have been. Uh, but I, I, I made three points for whatever they were worth, for whatever impact they had uh, during the meeting. The first is that anything we did should be done with our allies, in concert with our allies. Uh, because the whole Iranian objective is to divide us from our allies, and why should we play into Iranian hands? And second, whatever we do should be proportionate. Uh, and finally, we've given you no authorization to use military force. Uh, and don't think you can rely on what we passed in 2001 and 2002. That has no application here. Um, now, I don't know whether it's anything that we said or something that Tucker Carlson said. Um, <laughs> that caused him to reconsider. All I can say is, it's certainly not what the president said. The idea that, as a afterthought, he would ask the general, hey, by the way, with only 10 minutes to go before I can irretrievably call this off, how many people are going to get killed from this strike? <laughs> the idea that that would be an afterthought, maybe it wouldn't be for an afterthought for him, but that he wouldn't have been briefed on exactly the casualty count of any contemplated action uh, is absurd. So the president's explanation holds no water, but, but look, I'm glad that he called it off. Um, it will be terrifying if the reason he called it off was because some Fox News host talked him out of it, because then it's a whole different order of magnitude problem. Uh, but um, at the end of the day, uh, we're going to have to use whatever mechanisms we can in Congress to uh, restrain, if not the president, those around the president, uh, from getting us into another war. Um, as for the, the situation with Israel and the Palestinians and its neighbors, um, I take a lot of comfort in knowing that Jared Kushner is going to solve all this. <laughs> uh, so. I would say to Americans for Peace Now, uh, mission accomplished. Um, I, 
<laughs> you know, I, 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 the answer seems so, out, so self-evident. Um, as Dick uh, and Lois were saying on the video and tonight, um, the answer seems so self-evident that there's only one solution that works, and that's two states secure and living side by side. I don't, I don't even understand the, the thinking behind a one-state solution. It isn't a solution. Um, it's a demographic time bomb. And it's a, it's a dead end for is, Israeli democracy. It, it, it just doesn't add up. The only way it makes sense, I guess, is if you're operating within a political system that is put you on a railroad track to a destination leading nowhere, and you can't get off the track. Um, and I can kind of empathize with that problem because it feels like that here. Uh, we are bitterly divided here. We listen to different news stations. We get different news on our phones. It's increasingly difficult to break through those barriers. Um, so it's all too easy to understand, I guess, the dysfunction in Israel, the dysfunction in Britain. Um, but I, I will say this. Uh, the first hearing that we had on the Intel Committee when I became chair was on, it, on, on the global phenomenon that we are seeing, and that is the, the threat to liberal democracy. To me, this has always been the big picture uh, during the two and a half years we looked at what Russia did in our elections, and that is that, yes, Russia intervened, and they did so massively, and it was new and novel, um, but they've been intervening elsewhere for a long time. And this isn't also just about Russia, and it isn't just about Donald Trump. China has its own autocratic model. China is using technology to maintain its control of its people, and it's exporting that technology so other autocratic regimes can control their people. And a combination of economic disruption in the form of globalization and automation is causing enormous economic anxiety and migration, uh, and the social media information model now where fear and lies travel far faster than truths um, is a combustible mix that is really challenging liberal democracy everywhere. We see that in the rise of autocrats in Hungary, in Poland, in Turkey and the Philippines and Brazil. We see it in the rise of far-right parties in Austria, in Germany, in France. And this is, I think, the big challenge. And as Jews, this is something we have to pay assiduous attention to, because we've seen where it leads. Um, and so these are, I think, some of the overarching challenges. Part of the reason why it won't, it won't be over in November, even when Trump is gone. The challenge will remain. And and we have a lot of work ahead of us. Well, I, I would say in that context that A, you better make your plane, uh, and B, we are all very, very fortunate. Whenever I hear you, it gives me, if not comfort, at least confidence that we have one fabulous leader on top of such an array of issues. Thank you very much. Keep up the good work. Thank you. <laughs> Great to see you. I'll talk to you soon. Don't forget my enablers out here.